live on Facebook. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Good evening on Facebook and those on Zoom. Good evening, good evening, good evening. God bless you. Amen. Thank you for joining with me this evening. So good to see you all. Amen. <clears throat> you know, I think I was on a couple of times today. So good to see you guys who have come in once again. So good to see you all. God bless you all in May the Lord bless you. May his face shine upon you and give you peace. And so we're going to begin tonight's study. Amen. Giving God thanks and praise for it and thanking him for his word, for his word is truth. It is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our pathway. And so we thank God for his word. We thank God for the truth that's in his word, for the wisdom that's in his word. And we give him glory, honor, and praise. And I thank you for taking out time out of your schedule to join with me this evening. Amen. Prayerfully, we won't be too long at all, but just really to share what the Lord has placed into our hearts tonight um, to help us all, you know, as we live in this world. For there are so many things in this world that comes to hinder. There's so many things in this world that comes to affect us. And so therefore we need God's word in the midst of this world. And so let's begin in prayer, amen, as we thank God for his word, amen. Let us pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we come before you thanking you and giving you glory, honor, and praise for all that you have done, all that you're doing, and all that you will do in our lives. And so, Father, I pray right now in Jesus' name that, Lord, you would be with us in the midst of this study, and that, Father, you would lead and guide our hearts and our minds and teach us of your will and of your way. Don't allow us to reject your word. But, God, I pray in Jesus' name that we will receive it in the spirit in which it was given, a spirit of love, Lord God, and how, Father, you said, whom the Lord loves, he chastens, he corrects. And Father, we thank you for life experiences. We thank you for the challenges that we have gone through, Lord God, and how you have enabled us, Lord God, to rise above the storm clouds and how you have blessed us time and time again, Father. You've recovered us from brokenness. You've recovered us from painful situations. God, you've healed our souls and our minds and our hearts time and time again. And so, Father, even now we ask that you would search our hearts. And if there be any wicked way within us, please forgive us, wash us thoroughly, cleanse us from all sin, Lord God, I pray for my sister Natasha, Lord God, that you would touch her body in the name of Jesus and that, Father, you would give her healing virtue, Lord God, that she might recover from the pain that she's feeling, Lord God. And I pray in Jesus' name that you would work a miracle on her behalf, but not only her, but every one of us that are here, Lord God, if there's anything wrong in our bodies that would hinder us from hearing your truth, Lord God, I pray that you would remove it in the name of Jesus and that, Holy Spirit, you would grant unto me free flow that your word might proceed forth with power and authority. I thank you for your word, for your word is truth. It is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our pathway. And so we thank you for it. And we give you glory on and praise. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen. 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 God bless each and every one of you. Thank you for joining with me this evening. Thank you for, you know, taking out time of your schedule to join with me. And so I thank God for this privilege of, of getting into God's word. And so, you know, the title, the title is of all the trees of all the trees. It is a, a, a statement, um, a title that's based upon the word of God. If you look in, and let's turn to the scripture. If you look in Genesis chapter two, Genesis chapter two, and when you get to Genesis chapter two, I want you to look at, we're going to look at um, verses eight through nine. 
And then I'm going to look at verses 15 through 17. So verses 8 through 9 in Genesis chapter 2 and verses 15 through 17. And look what it says. It says, the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground, the Lord made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now let's skip down to verse 15. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die, okay? Now let's flip over to chapter three. <clears throat> and when you get to chapter three, um, I want you to look at verses um, six to seven. It said, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of his fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were open and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. Okay, so um, tonight this, this uh, topic of, of all the trees, of all the trees, this topic is about when you really look at it and, and I wanna talk very plainly to you all without being um, in any way foolish. Right, And so I really need for you guys to really hear from the depths of your hearts and allow God to give you the understanding, right? Um, what God did, according to Genesis chapter two, God created every tree, right? Every tree. He created every tree and he made each tree, not only was the tree good for food, but it was also pleasant, right? And if you go back and look at that, look at what he says, right? In verse nine, in chapter two, out of the ground, the Lord made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. So the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was not the only tree that looked good. And it was not the only tree that was good for food. For God created every tree to be that way, right? Now, <laughs> I'm going to break this down very simply, right, in, in a way that is amazing. Think about this, right? When we think about of all the trees, the question that I think about is why in the world did Eve really want that tree, right? If every tree, there was no distinguishing factor, there was nothing different, right? Right? There was nothing different about that tree, right? The only thing that was strange or unique is that God said, don't touch that one. Every other tree is just as good, right? Every other tree is just as marvelous. Every other tree is just as perfect for you, right? Just don't touch that one tree, right? Now we know that, you know, there thing called lust, right? And lust is merely desire, right? You and I both, all of us have lust, all of us have desire, right? Um, and, and where desire becomes bad is when God says, don't touch it. <laughs> when God says, leave that alone. When God says, see, there's nothing wrong with talking, but if God says, be quiet, then there's something wrong with talking, right? Nothing wrong with getting married. But if God says, don't marry that person, guess what? Your marriage, no matter how beautiful it is, is wrong. If, if God says, don't take that job, right? And you take that job, don't matter how much money they're paying, it's wrong, right? The word of God says, to him that knoweth to do good and don't do it, to him it is sin. Right. So if God tells me to do something, if God tells me not to do something and I do it, or if God tells me to do something and I don't do it, guess, guess what? It may not be sin for you, but it's sin for me. Right. Now, if you really look at this story, this story is really rooted in 
adultery. <laughs> and you may not understand it. It's really rooted. Right here is the basic tenets of adultery. It is the basic tenets of the root of adultery. And what is adultery? Adultery in its basic form is when someone who is married, right, has a, a physical, emotional, sexual relationship with someone who is not their spouse, right? Um, and, and, and this is what is adultery. Now, adultery is, is so powerful that it is one of the few sins, right? One of the few sins that evoke so much emotion, anger, <laughs> resentment, and also permanent hurt, distrust, betrayal, right? It, 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 it can create so much damage, not only in the relationship that you currently have, but it also can create damage even in you. The word of God says that um, anyone, right, who, who commits adultery or fornication sins against their own soul, right? Now, when I look over my life, I know that in my life, there's been times where I was adulterous or I was a fornicator. Um, and, and these things, I'm, I'm talking from a premise of someone who recognized the power of it in the sense of how strong its draw is, right? It, it's very strong. And maybe tonight, then may, uh, I'm gonna put myself on the chopping block because maybe none of you will confess, both online and on Zoom, maybe none of you will confess that, yeah, pastor, me too, right? So I'm gonna put myself out there, right? And, and what I can tell you is this, right? And, and I just want you that if you concur, I just want you wherever you are on Facebook, on Zoom, on the conference line, whatever, I just want you to blink once for yes and twice for no. Don't, don't admit, you don't have to say nothing. You don't have to do nothing. You don't have to raise your hand. Just blink twice for no. But one of the things you find out is that when, when, when adultery is involved, before adultery gets in, involved, there becomes an attachment. There becomes an attachment. There becomes an affinity to something. There becomes a draw to something. You will find yourself, right? And I got people online already saying, yeah, me too, right? <laughs> you, you, there becomes this draw, this attachment to something, right? Where you start to look forward to it, right? The, the interesting thing is, is that if, if God didn't say no, it wouldn't be wrong, mm -hmm. right? Because if, if you think about it, right, you know, a lot of people will say, a lot of people will say, you know, um, what's wrong with the fact that we love each other, right? And, and there may be this, this sense of love. There may be this sense of compassion and, and passionate feelings that, wait a minute, if you don't have it where you are, but you have it here, how can something feel so good be so wrong, right? <laughs> How can something that feels so pure and so clean and so wonderful and so joyful and joyous, how can this thing feel so wrong? Now, I, I wanna say this very, um, with, with caution, because there's a lot of people who are, you are the victim of adultery right? Maybe someone cheated on you. Maybe someone uh, uh, did something to betray your trust, right? And so there may be a sensitivity tonight with you not really trying to understand, you know, from the perspective of the adulterer. Why? Because you feel like you're the victim and you feel like there is no reason for it. There's no reason. There's no excuse for it. And yes, there is no excuse for it other than the fact that the person is guilty. They are guilty of something that in some way, shape, or form, all of us have done. And that is, we have touched things that God has said no to. We have touched things, whether it be in a relationship, or whether it be a cookie jar, or whether it be when the doctor told you, you can't eat this, and you still sneak it in your plate, whether it be, you know, in the sin of that, you know, uh, uh, you know, somebody tells you, hey, leave this alone, you know, don't look into this, or when our parents used to tell us, I got this gift, don't open it, but you try to sneak 
peek the package to see what's in it. You know, ladies, if your husband, you know, it's your anniversary and you so-called all of a sudden decide to clean the house extra because you're trying to find the gift that he got hidden somewhere. Guess what? It, it is something deep down inside in all of us where we really don't want to uh, not touch something that is told to us, don't touch. Don't touch, don't taste, don't, don't handle that. Don't mess with that, leave that alone. Don't worry about that, drop the subject. You know, don't talk about that no more. Leave that subject alone, right? How many times have many of us have been in situations where, you know, um, somebody has done wrong to us and then we said to that person, you know, that person says, listen, I'm sorry for what I've done to you. Please forgive me. And you say, I forgive you. And, and when you forgive them, you're supposed to let that thing go. How many of us have brought that thing up over and over and over again? Right. Because, and we use that as excuse, you know, I'm, you know, one of the things I, I can affirm in my life that I've not only been on the side of the, the one who was wrong, but I also been on the side of the one who was wronged by somebody else. Right. And, and deep down inside that thing stays in your mind right? It stays in your mind, right? And every time they do something, you want to give them peace of your mind. You want to say something to them because I remember what you did back in 1942. I remember what you did back uh, 10 years ago, right? And we use that as excuse because deep down inside in our humanity, we don't want to, um, we don't want to listen to instruction, but we want to be the judge of our own lives. Right. And, and the root of adultery is when a person says, why can't I have it? Why can't I have it? Why, why, why can't I have that? Then that thing seems good to me. And it amazes me. And I'm going to talk for a second from the perspective of a man. Let's say a man is married. Right. And he has a wife. Right. And this wife can give him pleasure. When you look in the word of God in, in the book of, um, I believe it's in Solomon. I believe it was. Um, wait, let me let me find it. I'm gonna find this real quick because this just popped in my mind, and I believe that this is pertinent to our discussion. Um, because mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, yeah, Proverbs. In Proverbs chapter five, Proverbs chapter five, and I'm gonna to be touching on this later on, but I want you to look at, in verses earlier, but I'm gonna be, I'm gonna want you to look at uh, Proverbs chapter five and verse 19. Oh, let's look at verse 18 and 19. It says, let your fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of your youth. As a loving deer and a graceful doe, let her breast satisfy you at all times and always be enraptured with her love, right? Now think about that. God says, when it comes to our spouses, ladies, the same thing applies to you when it comes to your husbands, right? When it comes to your spouses, God is saying, let that person satisfy you, right? Let that person satisfy you. So now when you think about an adulterer, an adulterer will go to someone else thinking that that person will satisfy my needs when satisfaction can be right where you are satisfaction can be right in your present relationship. But see, so it's, it amazes me because when a guy looks at another woman, he's like, dang, baby, you know, or, or, you know, he's looking at her and he's like, oh, baby got back. But guess what? Your wife got back too, right? <laughs> and your wife can do something too, right? But the problem is, is that adultery is based upon lust that says, why can't I have it? Keep in mind, in Genesis, we read that in Genesis, right? Every tree was good. Every tree was good. Everything that God created was good. Everything that God put together was good. But guess what? There was something in Eve that said, 
I want this tree more than I want every other tree, right? And keep in mind, in the garden was the tree of eternal life. Her and Adam could have taken up that tree and lived forever. But instead, they looked at the one tree that God says, don't touch. And, and when it comes to infidelity, when it comes to things like that, it is because deep down inside, listen, all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, right? All of us have messed up. All of us have in some way, shape or form. And you're gonna learn tonight that all of us in one way, shape or form are guilty of some form of adultery. Now don't turn me off, don't turn me off. Every single one of us are guilty in one form or another of adultery. And tonight, you're going to find out why. You're going to find out why, right? So everything that God created was perfect, right? So think about this. Let me give you the, the end, and then I'm going to bring it back, right? So think about this, right? How many of you, um, and on Facebook, you could just put me, whatever, um, on, on uh, Zoom, you could just raise your hand if you want. How many of you have ever been dissatisfied with your life? Like dissatisfied, like, you know, in a certain situation, I'm not happy. How many of you have ever felt that way, right? And right, we've all felt like that, right? In one way, shape or form, we've all felt that way, right? But check this out. If the Bible says God is gonna supply all your needs according to his riches and glory, then is God being unfair to you? Is God saying he's keeping back something good for you? No, the scripture says no good thing will he withhold from you. So where's that dissatisfaction coming from? That dissatisfaction is coming from the lust that is within us, in our flesh, in our bodies, the lust that is within our hearts, the immorality that is in us that says, I don't care how much God want, gives me. I don't care how much God has given unto me. Guess what? I want that. I don't care. Think about this. God created, God created. I mean, if you really think about it, God created every tree. Now, I don't know about y'all, but when you go into the wilderness, when you go into like any sort of place that has a lot of trees, there's a lot of different, you know, types of trees, right? So think about when he says every single tree, God made. Every single tree, God made. That was pleasant. Every single tree. Every single tree that was good for food, every single tree that was pleasant, every single tree that was good, God made. And he said, out of every single tree in the world, just don't touch that one tree. And that became their focus. And many of us, sometimes when we are fussing, we fail to remember how good God has already been to us how good he has already blessed us, right? We, we sit there and we say, ah, they didn't give me no raise, but guess what? You've had a job through how many different layoffs? <laughs> you know, uh, and, and your money has been enough to carry you throughout the time. Yeah, maybe things haven't been, uh, maybe things have been tight or maybe things have been rough at times, but guess what? In through each and every storm, God has what you through every storm you have come through every storm you've been challenged and guess what you came through it every heartache every heartbreak yeah it was frustrating but you came through it right because god is better to you than anything else that you don't have he's better he said he's going to supply all your needs according to his riches and glory here's the problem when it comes to adulterers adulterers do not receive what they have from God. And that's important to remember. In other words, when it comes to adultery in relationships, right? If you recognize that that relationship is from God, right? You won't be so quick to let it go, right? The problem is many of us get into relationships that are not godly. Many of us get into situations and relationships that are based upon some other ideology, some other philosophy, some other thing that is a motivator, right? And when we get into things like that, when we get into anything in, into a relationship like that, it becomes temporal. And this is why those things 
other things will draw our attention. Now, I'm going to break this down really quick. Let's look at, we're going to stay in Proverbs chapter 5. Let's go back to Proverbs chapter 5. Because I want you to see this, and, and tonight, you know, I want to talk about it. We have to identify these things in us, because if you don't identify it, if you always think it's somebody else, then you'll, chances are you'll be a victim of this. Look in Proverbs chapter 5. Proverbs chapter 5, and I'm going to read from verse 15 um, down to 23, down to the end. It says, and we read part of it already in verse um, 18 and 19, but let's look 15. It says, drink water from your own cistern, right? In other words, what God has given you in a relationship, the word of God says, drink water from your own cistern and running water from your own well. It says, should your fountains be dispersed abroad, streams of water in the streets? Let them be only your own and not for strangers with you. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of your youth. As a loving deer and as a grateful, graceful doe, let her breast satisfy you at all times and always be enraptured with her love. Look what it says in verse 20 down to the end. For why should you, my son, be enraptured by an immoral woman and be embraced in the arms of a seductress? Excuse me. For the ways of man are before the eyes of the Lord and he ponders all his paths. His own iniquities entrap the wicked man and he is caught in the cords of his sin. He shall die for lack of instruction and in the greatness of his folly, he shall go astray. Now, what we find in the world today, we find that so many different leaders, so many different people have been brought down. Even in this country, we've had presidents that have been brought down by their relationships with other women right? Um, we've had women that's been brought down by men. We had um, uh, uh, people who are heterosex uh, homosexual that are brought down by their homosexual partners. You know, even recently, I was looking on the news and even best friends, when you look at best friends, you know, at one point in the time, you know, um, the president's wife was best friends with another lady and they were confident she was her advisor. And now her best friend is writing a book about her secrets, right? And so when, when you are connected with people that are not God-given, then these relationships can be damaged by the world. These relationships can be damaged by the world. But when you have a relationship that God has given, when you have a relationship that is based upon God, the scripture uses it this way. It says a three-strand cord is not easily broken, right? Three strand meaning you, your spouse, and Christ. Those three strands are not easily broken, right? They're not easily severed. Why? Because life stresses you out. Let's be honest, right? When you have a husband and wife that is together and that husband and wife is, you know, they're, they're living together. They are, you know, they're serving um, together and they're raising a family together. What happens? Life puts strains on your relationship, correct? right? It puts strains, right? Whereas before, before you had the children, before you had the job and all this like that, you guys can spend all the time with each other. You can run around with each other. You can have a good time, right? But over the course of time, you start having children. Now your time is divided between, you know, well, who's going to take the kids? Who's going to care for this? Who's got to watch the kids? Who got to clean the kids? Who got to get up out of bed and, and take care of the kids, right? So all those things starts to put strains on your relationship. It starts to put a, a, a burden on your relationship. The job starts to put a burden on your relationship, right? The house starts to put a burden on your relationship. And those strains can pull at your relationship until you become like Adam and Eve was when they got into trouble. What did they start doing? They started blaming each other. They started blaming each other. They started blaming each other and saying that it's your fault, it's your fault, it's your fault, right? Um, how many times you have parents that go to a wife or go to a husband or a husband or go to a wife and say, you better get your son, you better get your daughter, right? Right? Because you start to feel like you're in this thing alone and these strains on the relationship will cause for you to not use the proper building blocks to keep that relationship strong. And any relationship, I don't care how beautiful it is, how many relationships have had beautiful weddings, beautiful starts, and ended miserably. You know, when I tell people uh, years ago, when I got married, I mean, for the first, um, like, seven, eight, 
almost nine years, you know, the marriage was beautiful. It was beautiful. I mean, it was beautiful. I mean, we were inviting people to our house. You know, we constantly had people over. People would come over to learn. You know, couples would come over to, to talk and, and stuff like that. And, and my wife would hang out with the, with the wife and I would hang out with the husband and we would talk and then come back together and eat. You know, our kids were running around. The family was together. Everything was great until both of us started having separate attentions. And this world is designed to pull apart anything that represents God. And marriage itself was created by God to, to be a symbolism, if you will, of something that is heavenly. It is an earthly example of a heavenly principle right? Um, it was not that the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was anything, because guess what? God created it, right? And the scripture says he created every tree that was pleasant and good for food. But there was a restriction placed upon man, as there are restrictions placed upon all of us, just like in relationships, there are restrictions on your relationship. No, you can't go out with that friend, you know? I mean, that might have been your best bud. And, and sometimes, you know, like I know people who, you know, uh, male and female, who have been such good friends until there's been times that they've been in places where that person spent a night over the house, right? And, and nothing went on, right? I know people like that. And even in my life, I had situations like that where I had very close friends that, you know, came over and said, hey, would you mind if I crash over your house? I, I don't feel like driving home. Sure. Take the couch. Cool. You're good, right? No problem. And nothing went on, right? But but even though nothing get on, I can't go to my wife and say, hey, babe, right? She goes, honey, what are you doing? Oh, I'm I'm setting up the the, the, the bed. For who? Right. For, for my best friend, my best friend, uh, uh, Kathy or Susan or whoever. Right. And, and who is that? Right. Because you can't just do whatever you want. Right. And so in relationships, there becomes this restriction. But deep down inside, none of us want to be restricted. None of us. Our flesh doesn't want to be told no. Right. That's why we feel some kind of way when we have uh, treated people well. And then all of a sudden we ask them to do something for us and they go, no, I can't do that. And right away we feel some kind of way. After all I'm done for you, you can't do this for me. Right. We start feeling that for, that way. Why? Because deep down inside, we never want to be told no. That's why children and some adults, that's why we pout. <laughs> that's why we if the person say hey listen i'm just busy right then we go well fine i'll just leave you alone right we never want to be told no we never want to be denied anything that we desire and we're so fair right you know sometimes we want it this way and sometimes we want it that way right but the truth of the matter is we can't have everything our way we can't it's impossible, right? And so God gives restriction. Look at what he says. He says, you got to drink water from your own cistern. You got to learn how to discipline yourself and drink water from your own cistern. Yeah, you know, if that's your boo and you decided not to wait on God, you decided not to do the right thing, you decided, you know, you, you was rushing, you was anxious to do it, that's your boo, you's married now, you know, hey, then you got to make it work. You got to make it work. Because th this is a challenge for all of us. If we're not careful, the challenge for all of us is that we will, hold on, it seemed like I lost my, my video. There we go. The challenge for all of us that if we're not careful, um, we will have something that could potentially be well for us. Something that could potentially, through God's power, be good for us. And we will sabotage it. And not only sabotage it, but sabotage our own lives. Let's look in Proverbs chapter six. Proverbs chapter six. And when you get to Proverbs chapter six, let's look at verse 32. 
no, let's look at, <laughs> let's look at verses, um, yeah, let's look at verse 32. It said, whoever commits adultery with a woman lacks understanding. He who does so destroys his own soul. Let's keep reading. Wounds and dishonor he will get, and his reproach will not be wiped away. Okay? And here's that emotion that we talked about. Look at what he says. He says, for jealousy is a husband's fury. Therefore, he will not spare in the day of vengeance. He will not accept. He will accept no recompense, nor will he be appeased, though you give many gifts. And many of us have, have found out in our lives that when we dishonor one another, when we hurt one another in this way, or when we've been hurt in this way, right, there, there becomes this feeling of, you know, that although I forgive you, it is, it is virtually hard to forget particularly when things get rough, particularly when things get hard, it is hard to forget. And these are things that oftentimes will dredge up during those times of difficulty and crises in a relationship. Every relationship will go through problems. Every relationship will go through difficulties. And adultery is something and fornication is something that will cause for there to be no trust, there'll be no help and that person will shut down. And this is what we find, you know, even in, you know, in my lifetime, I've counseled so many couples who have gone through adult, adultery or fornication or infidelity. And, and one of the things I find is that if it happened against the wife or the husband, they will begin to get friendships with other people and closeness with other people. And the husband or wife that was the guilty one will feel like I can't intrude, right? They, they, they kind of stand off. They stand off. And, and that's a, a horrible thing because of the fact of that the husband knows, let's say if it's the husband that's guilty, the husband knows that I've hurt my wife, right? I've hurt my wife. And so when the wife gets these extra friends, the husband almost feels excluded. And that exclusion from his wife is the wedge that the enemy works through. It's the wedge because the word of God says, the two shall become one flesh. And see, this is quite, it is impossible if the person that you marry is not godly. You can't become one complete flesh with them with Christ because how can two walk together unless they agree? So the challenge is when we've had adultery or, or uh, infidelity in our lives, right? How do we recover from that stuff? Because deep down inside, it's a wound that cannot be satisfied. It's a wound that, that will give dishonor. It's a wound that really sits there. And so many people, maybe even some of you watching tonight, it, it's happened to you. And because it's happened to you, you may not realize how it has painted your world. You may not realize how it has affected you, where deep down inside, you don't trust and you don't surrender yourself and you don't allow yourself to be vulnerable anymore. That And vulnerability is something that allows for love to grow and to blossom, right? But when you've been cheated on, when you've been hurt in this manner, right? You, you sort of shut down that side of you that loves freely because deep down inside, you take everybody with a grain of salt. And so the challenge is how do we recover from that, right? How do we recover from those times of hurting, those times of breaking? How do we recover from those situations of life that have weighed so heavy on our hearts that although we want to let it go, we just seem to can't let it go, right? And, and I wonder if there's anybody, anybody has experienced that? Anybody have experienced that in your lifetime that you've experienced that? Let me know in the comment field or you can let me know um, if you're on Zoom, you can let me know. But if you've experienced that, say, I've experienced that. Just, just say, I've experienced that. 
Okay. I've experienced that. Okay. Amen. Amen. I didn't understand Amen. that. Amen. Amen. So, so these are things that has happened to so many people. And, and it becomes, you almost become hardened by life, right? You become hardened. You become, you start feeling like I'm the only one that can watch out for me. I'm the only one that can protect me, right? You start to feel like I'm the only one. And a lot of people are, are chiming in right now on Facebook saying that they have experienced that. And so let me, let me say this to you. Let me say this to you. First of all, you know, um, my prayers are with you right now because, because I know that it is a very difficult place to recover from. And, and although you may try and you may desire, you know, to do that, you may say in your heart and in your mind, you know, we even have men that are saying that they have experienced that, right? And so sometimes what that does, it colors our choices, right? It, it colors our choices, you know, because now we're looking for people who sometimes we look for people that we can dominate. We, 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 because once we've experienced that, once we've gone through that trouble, we don't want to be vulnerable no more. So we look at, we look for people that we can dominate, people that we can be in control of, right? Because I can't trust anyone, you know, I can't trust other people. So I need to be in control. And so, and, and what it does, it paints our decisions, right? It, it, it paints our decisions in such a way that we, we may find ourselves in situations that although on the surface, it looks like what we're doing is, 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 is decent, it's nice. Oh, wow. You know, this person is loved again and all like that. But oftentimes the, the next relationship is a relationship based upon convenience or based upon control a control factor that I can, I can control this person, like this person I can rule, right? And not in a negative way, not in a way that is abusive or anything like that, but in, in a way that says, I can control this person. And so therefore, I can sort of give myself to this person because of the fact of that I know how far they're going to go, right? But then here's the problem with doing things that way. When you do things that way, the problem becomes that that person may not be everything that you desire. Because oftentimes what happens, the person that we desired or the type of person that we desired was the first person we gave ourselves to. And usually the second person is like the second best, right? Not in all cases, but usually the second person is sometimes the second best. It requires for God to intervene in our lives, for God to make the choice for us or else we'll make a choice based upon the wrong criteria, right? Let's go further in the word of God, right? Let's look at Galatians chapter five. Galatians chapter five. Galatians chapter five in verse uh, 19. It says, now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness. So now this scripture talks about that this is in your flesh. It's in your flesh to be adulterous. It's in your flesh to be a fornicator. It is, in, it is in your flesh to be unclean, to be lewd. It is in your flesh to have these things in you, right? And so all of us have the propensity and the we have the um, potential to do one or more of these things. And the list continues as you keep reading, right? We have the, the, the capabilities of, of manifesting these things in our lives because these things offer some form of pleasure to us, right? The reason why God is against adultery is because adultery is wrapped up 
in covetousness, is wrapped up in covetousness and is wrapped up in a resentment towards God that he's not given me the best. He's not giving me the best. Why would God keep this from me, right? It's wrapped up in that. Like, why can't I have it, right? Why can't I have it? I wrote down here that the prelude, the prelude to adultery is enticement and cultivation of physical desire, right? So once we start desiring something that God hasn't given to us, we have to cultivate this desire. We have to cultivate, we have to keep manifesting it, right? And that's not love because love is not something that you have to wind up. Love is something that just is, right? And, and, and see, love, see, that's why love is different than passion, right? Passion, you know, comes from being passionate, right? And when you're passionate towards somebody, when you are intimate towards somebody, when you communicate towards somebody, it generates passion. And, and many of us take that, that thought process and we say, wow, this person loves me. I feel so good around them. But guess what? What happens when they stop doing that? Do you also feel good around them? Or do you start missing some of it? And many people have has misconstrued passion for love. Love is something that stays the same. We find that out in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Love never changes. It always stays the same. It stays at the same level at all times. And even, you know, a lot of people say love grows, right? Love doesn't grow. Love is just love. And the only thing that it does as love gets an understanding, right? Because like, let's say, for example, if I love someone, right? If I love someone, right? At first, I may know, let's say, a hundred things about them, right? And I love them, right? So those hundred things I will involve myself in. Why? Because I love them. But as I spend time with them, I tend to learn more about them, and then I end up doing more for them. It's not that my love grows, because love never fails. Love never changes, right? Any love that changes is not love. It's passion. It's eros, which is, is erotic, erotic. Um, it is uh, phileo, which is a uh, friendship type of love, right? Yeah, I, as a friend, I can grow closer in my friendship, but my love never changes because love is something that comes from God and it's something that is wrapped in the knowledge of what God knows about that person. This is why a person can love someone, you know, when they talk about, you know, and this doesn't happen all the time, but when you talk about love at first sight, some of those things can happen. Why? Because if my heart is right with God and if her heart is right with God, God can give me an immediate love for somebody. Like oftentimes I've meet, met people in the church, right? I met people in church that I met them day one and right away there's this connection that I don't even understand. It's not based upon my knowledge. It's not based upon my understanding. It's not based upon my experience with them. But guess what? There's this closeness that I almost feel like you are a part of me and I'm a part of you and, and it's a mutuality, right? And that can happen in a relationship. This mutuality where you could feel each other. And I'm not talking about passion. I'm talking about where you can feel each other, where you can understand each other without words, you know, where, where you look at each other and you consider one another in everything. This is what God wants in our relationship. He wants there to be sincere, perfect love, right? That love, but that can't happen if we have desires that we will not listen to God and say, I can't have that. Because love has restrictions. <laughs> love has restrictions. And a lot of people think that if you restrict me, it's because you don't love me. <laughs> no, love has restrictions. Love has restrictions. 
love has corrections. The scripture says, whom the Lord loves, he chastens, right? So if a husband love a wife, if a wife love a husband, you're going to correct that person. You're going to say, no, that right there, no, you ain't doing that. Uh uh. But guess what? The love don't change. That friend right there, uh uh. No, 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 no. You ain't bringing that friend in this house. But the love don't change, right? And, and when we love each other, we tend to respect each other, right? We respect each other, right? The husband is not fearful of the wife. The wife is not fearful of the husband. But you reverence each other in such a way that you respect one another. Right, The word of God tells the husbands, be careful how you treat your wife or your prayers will be hindered. In other words, God won't even hear you, right? And, and same thing with the wives, you know, God looked at Eve and said to Eve, what is this that you have done, right? And then the scripture says a wise woman builds her house, but a foolish woman tears it down with her own hands. So, so true love from God has restrictions, it has correction. True love from God um, has limits in the sense of that it will limit you to what you can do and what you should do. Like oftentimes I see husbands um, and even sometimes wives that maybe you're the one who is good with finances, right? You're the one that's good with finances, but the other person is not. And so you exclude them out of that. Love doesn't, doesn't exclude. Love teaches. Love helps. It guides. But at the same time, it puts up walls to say, no, we can't do this, you know? So it's nothing wrong with a husband saying to a wife, no, I got to take your credit cards, babe, because maybe she don't know how to stop spending, you know? <laughs> maybe she, she just can't say no when those flashing lights are blinking, right? And, and you bringing us down, right? I, I got to be able to restrict you, right? And, and deep down inside, if you love me, then you know that I'm not doing it to harm you, but I'm doing it to help us, right? I'm doing it to help us. And these are some of the challenges, you know, like oftentimes, you know, the people that I know that in my lifetime that I have loved, I've seen it in myself that I, I desire to see their best, you know, I desire to see their best. And so because of that, if I see something from my years of wisdom or my years of knowledge that they're doing that is counterproductive, no, I'm, I'm going to say something. And a lot of people will, you know, because they haven't come to that level of love yet. A lot of people say, well, don't talk about, it. I don't want to talk about this. I don't want to talk about this. Okay, then you don't want my love. Because the fact is love corrects. Right? Let's go through. We're almost done. We're almost done. Right? Let's look at 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2. And when you get to 2 Peter chapter 2, I want you to look at, um, let's look at verse 12, uh, 12, 12 to 14. Okay, it says, but these like natural brute beast made to be caught and destroyed, speak evil of the things they do not understand and will utterly perish in their own corruption and will receive the wages of unrighteousness as those who counted pleasure to carouse in the daytime. They are spots and blemishes carousing in their own deception while they feast with you having eyes full of adultery and that cannot cease from sin, enticing unstable souls. They have a heart trained, look what it says, in covetous practices and are accursed children. It is important to know that when we don't put uh, um, controls and boundaries on the, the desires that we have, right? You know, oftentimes you got to say to yourself, even as a person, I know in my own life, there are times that there are certain things that I like to do. Like I know that I am, I love gadgets. I love new technology. I love to, to always improve, you know, in my technology, right? And so that can cause me to spend a lot of money, right? Because there's always something new, right? There's always something new. Right. And so because I had to put certain limits on myself. Right. Otherwise, it can get out of control. 
You know, I know some of y'all may not want to admit that, right? Some of y'all may not want to admit that you got too many shoes, too many. You know, you got too many dresses. You got too many sweaters. You got too many, you know, suits. You got too many stuff, right? Um, but but I, um, you know, what I had to do is recognize that if I'm going to um, go forward in life, I have to learn how to beat my own body into subjection. Right, because if 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 God blesses me to be someone's husband, they don't need somebody who's out of control. Right, and same thing, ladies. If you're going to be somebody's wife, you can't be an out of control person, and and you can't say if you're out of control now that once I get married, I'm going to be in control. No, you won't. No, you won't. The same habits you will do. So one of the controls that I put on my life is that. I cannot buy any new technology until I first get rid of the old technology. When, what I mean by that is I got to sell it. I got to sell it. I get rid of it, right? And, and what that has done, it would cause me that I see something I want, but now I have to wait like sometimes six months, sometimes a year because nobody would buy that other thing. Right. And I would I would keep looking at that thing. And in the process of time, it would cause me some time to see a flaw in that new thing. And then I go, no, nah, I don't want it. Because ultimately, most of our desires oftentimes are impulsive. Right. It's impulsive. And and the media, the, the media department, the the. Um, you know, when you look at marketing departments, they know that as people, we are impulsive, right? Um, you know, uh, when you talk about lust that's in the world um, and the enemy uses lust, he knows that you are impulsive. He knows that we are quick to flirt. We're quick to jump at stuff. We're quick, you know, to buy stuff. We're quick to go to the grocery store for a gallon of milk and we come back with three grocery bags, right? We're quick to do all that stuff, right? And so you got to learn how to discipline yourself. Paul says, I beat my body into subjection. Right. I have to I have to discipline this body. I have to discipline my will. Right. And I got to learn, you know, some of you, you know, you may not think about this, but, you know, some of you, when it comes to you get a raise or you get a bonus or you get money, all of a sudden you want to go out. And I mean, you need to think about that for a second. Think about that. Like I said in the beginning, if you really listen tonight, you'll find that all of us are guilty of adultery because we are desiring things that may not be good for us, that God may not have chosen for us, right? And, and we have this innate ability. My mother used to say that when you get money, money burn holes in your pocket, right? Because we start to look at money and we start to say, you know, oh man, I got this extra money or you get this new job and you're making that much more money. And right away, you think about what I could spend it on, right? You get more vacation time <laughs> on your job and right away you think about where I can go. Not realizing that you're just spending, 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 spending. I remember years ago, Years ago, I don't know how it happened. Trust me, I really don't know. I was working for um, a place called CBS Toys, right? And this was years ago. I mean, years. I was a teenager. And I was working for this, this place, and I was making $5 an hour, right? $5 an hour, right? And, <laughs> and when I was making $5 an hour, I bought my lunch every day. I bought snacks. I bought my breakfast, right? I bought some clothes. I even went out, right? Now, I know times have changed and things have gotten more expensive, right? But I want you to understand the concept. I bought everything that I needed to buy on $5. But I remember thinking, man, if I could just make $7, right? Man, if I could just make $10 an hour. Oh, man, if I could just make $15, $20 an hour. Next thing you know, you want $50 an hour. $75 an hour. Now you're looking for six figures. Some of you may be coming home. Your salary today may be five figures, you know, in the upper five figures, you know, 70, 80, 90,000. Some of you may be over 100,000. 
But what do you have to show for it? What do you have to show for it? Is all your money put into stuff that's just a bucket with holes that eventually waste away? And eventually all your wealth is squandered because we have not disciplined ourselves to say no, to tell our desires no, to tell, you know, sometimes you gotta decide, you know, like there was a point in time where I was using credit cards left to right, zip, 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 credit card, credit card, credit card. I finally decided no more credit cards. So, you know, you go to the store and they entice you. Oh my God. If you apply for this credit card, you'll get extra $20 off your order today. And you're thinking, ooh, $20 off my order, but you ain't thinking about the spider web that you're now in. Because credit is not wealth. It's not wealth. Credit, the word of God says, the borrower is slave to the lender. Credit puts you in bondage, particularly if you don't know how to use it. Credit is not a means to say, because you have a $5,000 limit, that you could spend $5,000. No, the only way you have a $5,000 limit, I'm saying to spend, is if you have $5,000 cash to pay out. Because if you don't have $5,000 cash, then no matter what you say, let's say if you have a credit card with a $5,000 limit, you have a credit card with a $5,000 limit, but let's say you have $200 in your, in your bank. Guess what? That's your limit, $200. Because that's all you have. Credit gives a false reality that I'm wealthier than what I think I am. And that's what lust does. Lust, you know, like we often say about when it comes to adultery and, and fornication, a lot of people say the grass is always greener on the other side. Yeah. But then I think it was Maya Angelou that said, yeah, and the water bill is higher too. So yeah, the grass is greener, but it costs something. So when you think about, you know, all the things that we desire, when we desire to do something that God has said, no, it's going to cost you something. It may cost you your relationship. In some cases, some people have lost their lives. Some people have lost their lives. Some people, have, some people in history has lost their body parts <laughs> because they did the wrong thing. You know, I'm just telling you that it's one of those things that the word of God says, dishonor is going to come your way. So lust is desire that is out of control, right? And when you covet something, when you covet something, it encourages your heart and your mind to desire what someone else has, right? So lust is when your desire is out of control, right? Because all of us have desires. All of us have desires. And guess what? We have got to be the ones that say no to our desires sometimes. Just because you want it, don't mean you should have it. Just because you want to say it, don't mean you should say it. You got to discipline yourself to tell yourself no. Otherwise, the, 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 least of, the, the, the less times that you discipline yourself to say no, right? The more you're going to say no, you're going to say yes to the things you should say no to. And eventually it could lead into infidelity because if you have not denied yourself in the small things, eventually you won't deny yourself in the big things. Come on, think about your life. How many times have many of us have said in our lives, we've said in our life, I'll never do that. And you end up doing it. What happened? You became desensitized by the things in this world and the things in this world taught you that you could have it. You think that you think people that are strung out on drugs decided, oh, I want to waste away my life and lose my job and lose my family and catch a disease and and be homeless. No. But lust, lust, desire that that is out of control, desire that out of control, ladies and gentlemen, right? You got to discipline your tongue. 
You got to discipline your eyes. You got to discipline your ears. You got to dis discipline your heart. You can't allow, allow for this body to dictate what you do. Otherwise, it begins to grow and take over you. And now you become a pack rat. You got things in your house that you don't even need. You, you jump on QVC or, or Amazon and you got box after box after box after box after box after box coming to your house and none of that stuff you need. None of that stuff you need. It becomes a wasteful spending. It becomes a wasteful life. And for some of us, especially those of us who are single, this is one of the reasons why God can't put you in a relationship because you have no discipline. And, and a relationship is gonna require discipline because guess what? Not only will you have discipline from God's perspective and from your own perspective, but you're gonna have discipline from their perspective, right? That husband is not gonna want that wife to do everything. That wife is not gonna want that husband to do everything. And then if you're hiding stuff now and you're doing things now in secret, you think you won't do it then in secret? Yes, you will. And eventually it could lead into infidelity. Why? Because you keep secrets. You keep secrets. As children of God, we have to discipline ourselves in time. We got to discipline ourselves in what we say and what we do. We have to discipline ourselves in taking care of our bodies. We have to discipline ourselves in cultivating our minds and our health. We have to discipline ourselves in our wealth, right? Otherwise, we could be heavenly bound, but no earthly good be heavenly bound and no earthly good. We be on our way to heaven, but we are a horrible husband. On our way to heaven, but a jacked up wife. On our way to heaven, but a sorry parent. You know, I mean, it, it becomes something that it becomes a shame because we've got to, we, we have to get this body under subjection. And the only way to do that is in the small thing the small things, you start at the small things. And then when it comes to the big things, when it comes to something, when let's say I love my wife, right? I, I desire my wife, right? I'm in love with my wife and me and her, we're, we're making love on a regular basis, right? We're not denying one another. We are, we are spending that time with each other, right? We're, we're still dating each other. We're still having a wonderful time, but guess what? I don't, I don't care about all y'all fake people that's talking this crap. Don't tell me that you don't go through life and your body don't see somebody else that you think is attractive. Don't you dare tell me that. Because the devil is a liar and so are you. If you tell me, oh, no, Pastor, I, I, I love my husband, I love my wife. You're right, Pastor. And I don't, I don't look at nobody else. No, I just got, I only have eyes for you. Yeah, yeah, the devil is a liar. You know good and well. And thank you, Sister for sister Natasha, for even admitting that and helping me in that, right? We, we know that this flesh, right? I don't care how good that person is to us. We walking down the street and, and look, and I'm talking to the fellas right now, your baby, your wife, your woman could be like what? She could be like, whoa, she could be everything your heart and body desires everything, right? You're going to go on the street and you're going to see somebody else, right? And your flesh going to say, why not? Why can't I look? Why can't I dream? Why can't I fantasize? Why can't I, why, why can't I not imagine what they look like without their clothes on. Why, why, why I can't, you know, when I hug them and I feel something rubbing up against me, why I can't think, come on, you know, I know y'all saints. I know y'all saints watching, praise the Lord, glory, hallelujah. But guess what? You encased in flesh. And I've seen, I've seen saints, right? Trying to cover up their lust. And it's like, oh, 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 oh. I, I've seen old women come up to me. Come here, Pastor. Give, give mama sugar. Yeah, you better back off, lady. 
You know, <laughs> I've seen so much stuff in my lifetime, right? And, and honestly, you know, there are times that I got to look away because I've seen some things that my body has desired. I've seen some things that made my head turn, right? And maybe nobody else will admit this but I'm going to admit it to you. You know, you, your flesh. Hmm. Look, let me tell you something. Your flesh, until you get to glory, is corrupt. In your flesh dwells nothing good, nothing, nothing good, right? So when we think about, you know, infidelity, and we think about Adam and Eve and how they looked at the tree and they desired it and they took of it, even though God said, don't do it. Guess what? We're no different. Because Jesus even said, Jesus said, if you look on a woman and lust after in your heart, you look on a woman and you look at her and say, whoo, girl, guess what? You've already committed adultery. And ladies, you ain't no different. I know y'all try to act like, no, pastor, that's only men. Yeah, uh-huh, yeah. Um, you know, good and well, right? Every time I used to go to those Tyler Perry plays and, and Tyler Perry will always have some strapping young man all buffed that would always take off his shirt. And half of the women that was in the audience talking about praise the Lord, now all of a sudden we go, whoo. And I bet you that wasn't praise the Lord. I bet you that wasn't hallelujah, thank you, Jesus, no. It was something else that their flesh was considering, right? And, and, and this is the thing. That's why Christians, Christians went to see Shades of Grey. That's why Christians went to see a Girl's Trip. That's why Christians went to see how Stella got her groove back, uh-huh, right? You and, and, and countless of other stories, right? Because we have not denied our flesh. Yeah, we deny our flesh in some things. But I know my biggest problem was that I was letting my flesh dictate what I want. That was my biggest problem. My flesh was dictating what I wanted. And what I wanted, I pursued it. What I wanted, I went after what I wanted, I, I, I went after. I chased it down. I hounded it down. I purposed to get it because my flesh says I want it. You know, that's what happened in the life of one of David's children. Whereas this, this man falls in love with one of David's children, one of his daughters, his, 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 I think it's his daughter. And he was like, oh man, I love her. Oh man, I love this woman. I gotta have this woman, right? And then he forced himself on her. In other words, he rapes her. And after he rapes her, now he don't love her no more. Come on, you know how it is. Before we get it, oh my God, we're pursuing it 100%. Oh, I'll do anything. I'll drink your bath water after you use it, right? We'll do all that stuff like that, right? And then once we get it, we're like, yeah. All right, well, I'll see you next week. You know, we'll say, you know, like, uh, I don't feel like getting you a glass of water. Go get it yourself. You know, we, we become, because once we have it, what did Adam and Eve do? Once they ate of that tree, what did they do? They ran and hid themselves, covered themselves, because they knew they were naked. They knew that that tree wasn't the end all be all anymore. Prior to that, it was. And that's what happens to each of us. Because we have corrupted ourselves, we have corrupted ourselves with the things that's in the world. So let's let's wrap this up. I got uh, uh, two more scriptures for you. First Corinthians chapter six, and this is something that I want us to really start considering in our own lives when we start to look at our own lives and the choices that we're making. Are your choices based upon, you know, wisdom? Or is your choice is based upon impulsiveness? Are you being impulsive? And generally, if you are being impulsive, that is your flesh in control, okay? It doesn't matter what it is. I don't care if it's a stick of gum. You gotta start denying that flesh 
in everything. You got to start denying that flesh because the more you deny it, the more you're killing that flesh. And then the more you gain mastery over it. First Corinthians chapter six. And when you get to first Corinthians chapter six, let's look at verses 12 to 14. It says, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Foods for the stomach and the stomach for foods, but God will destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And, the, and God both raised up the Lord and God both raised up the Lord and will also raise up us up by his power. So in other words, he's saying that as a believer, your body belongs to the Lord. So because my body belongs to the Lord, I can't do anything that I want to do. I can't go anywhere that I want to go. And honestly, I am cognizant, and I'm talking about me. This is my testimony. This is what I walk according to. I'm cognizant of my body's desire. Honestly, there are times that the Holy Spirit has to really correct me because there are some times that I get caught up in something and, and I'm not realizing that I'm just letting my flesh do, right? I'm just letting my flesh do in something. And so I'm like, okay, Lord, I got to pull that back. I got to pull that back. I got to stop doing that. Why? Because of the fact that the more you allow your flesh to have its way, even in the small stuff, eventually it gets stronger. It gets stronger and its willpower gets stronger when it comes to other things that may be detrimental for you. Okay. And then the last scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, the very next chapter, okay, and verse 2. It says, nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, let's, let each man have his own wife and each woman have her own husband, right? This is a scripture that you oftentimes hear me talk about on so many different levels. You gotta, you know, when it comes to sexuality, right? If you are a sexual person, you must know from God's perspective how to get your own husband and your own wife. And it's gotta be based upon God's perspective. Otherwise, if you marry that person or connect with that person out of lust or out of desire, right? Eventually that's going to change. And that's the sad reality. The sad reality is eventually lust get tired of consistency. And I'm gonna share that with you so powerfully. Lust gets tired of consistency. Somebody can love you to life, but if you connect with them out of lust, you will get tired of them. You'll get tired of their love. You'll get tired of them. You know, if, if you, you know, I know my dad, when my dad grew up, my dad had to stop going to school at a young age because his father left home. And so my dad um, had to get a job. He was the oldest child. He had to get a job and support his siblings and his mother. And, um, and so when my dad became a man himself, the only way he knew how to love is to work. That's the only way he knew how to love. You know, that was his um, contribution to the family. I'm just gonna work, I'm gonna work, I'm gonna work. And he worked and came home and brought the check home and gave it to my mother and told my mother, do what you need to do with it. And he went back to work. And then my father couldn't work enough. He worked and started his own business. And that's all he did. He never played with us, never, you know, uh, uh, it, the times that he hung out with us doing things is because my mother initiated it, but not my dad, right? My dad did not understand it. He didn't understand the, 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 the intricacies of relationship because from a child, from I think around 13 years old, he had to work to support his family, right? So he didn't understand those things, right? And so, um, and, and that became something that was quite difficult 
in our family because of the fact that although we had mother and father in the household, as a son growing up, I didn't want to be like him because I had no connection to him. You understand? I had no connection to him. My connection was with my mom, right? Which brought a lot of women into my life and also a familiarity with me with women, right? And so whereas all the people say, oh, he's a player, he's this. No, it wasn't that. It's just that I understood women more because I spent more time with them than I did with men, right? It wasn't until I became older and in my teenage years, I started hanging out with men purposefully. I started, God started sending older men into my life, you know, that would like talk to me and share things with me. And, and it was like, some of the things I was like, that's stupid. You know, like, why would you do something like that? Right. And, and so I had a greater familiarity with women than I did with men. Right. And so that became the building blocks that my flesh used to do manipulations and to do all kinds of foolish things, right? Because of the training that I got from my mother. Now she didn't train me to be evil, but you gotta understand your flesh is evil. And I'm, I'm breaking this thing down to y'all so seriously and laying myself out there on the sacrificial block, really because I don't care about what people think about me, because ultimately I believe that when, when my heart is right before God and I'm sharing with you from my experiences, my hope is that some of you will pick up the mantle and realize, you know what, you got problems too. You got some issues too. And we need to stop hiding our problems and acting like we ain't got no problems when you do, right? We have issues in our lives, some of which came from our childhood, some of which came from our teenage years or maybe experiences or heartaches or heartbreaks that you've experienced or uh, abuse or, or rape or molestation or whatever the case can be. And it has tainted us. You know, infidelity in our life has tainted us. And we have to be cognizant of that tainting so that we now discipline ourselves to doing things, right? Doing things the right way disciplining ourselves to making sure that like, for example, you know, here I am in this house, right? By myself, right? Not making this house a whole house. Y'all understand what I mean? And I I'm just being flat out with y'all because too often we've been so super spiritual because we're afraid to talk about what's really going on underneath the carpet. And underneath the carpet is, yeah, Pastor Rodney, with all his knowledge, Pastor Rodney, with all his understanding and godliness, can be the biggest devil on the street if he allow his flesh to get away with him. Do you understand what I mean? And some of you, you are beautiful women, beautiful men, but if you don't gain control or mastery over your desires and your flesh, you'll be the prom fiend and not the prom queen, okay? And, and that's real talk, real talk. You know, a lot of people come on Facebook and stuff like that because they want to be holier than thou and, and sit there and stand from a, a, a plateau of let me tell y'all how y'all ought to live. No, I'm telling you how you ought to live, but I'm using myself as an example and the things that I've gone through and the challenges of life that I've had, you know, and how it amazes me on a daily basis that God has chosen me because I know the journey that I've been on, right? I know the path that I walk. And I know that it's nothing but his grace and mercy that I'm here today. It's nothing but his, his power why I am here today and why I'm still standing. So I'm not gonna stand here from a plateau of, of haughtiness or arrogance and make y'all think that, oh, I'm never touched by those things. I'm just, uh, I'm just beyond the feelings of this world. The devil is a liar. There's sometimes I'm driving down the street and I go, whoa, and I'm, oh, stop that, right? And I'm like, you're not gonna do that here. You're not gonna, you're not gonna get carried away with yourself, right? You know, and, and there's sometimes that I've seen people, like even recently, you know, someone, um, someone was calling me 
on on Messenger. And I said, and I and I replied, and I kept denying because I was actually busy. And I kept denying. They kept calling back and calling back and calling back. And I was like, look here, sis. <laughs> I was like, this ain't happening, right? And I'm not talking on Facebook, right? Guess what? Kept calling, kept calling. You know what I did? Block. You understand what I mean? Look, don't, don't even waste my time. Look, I'm going to give you criteria. I'm going to give you uh, boundaries. Keep trying to break the boundaries. Keep trying to break the boundaries. Look, I'm man enough, bold enough, mad enough, crazy enough to block you. Point blank. And I don't care what people think, because deep down inside, we are running for our lives. We are running for our lives. And, and I'm like, God, so help me. I don't want to fall. I don't want to mess up. I don't want to mess up. I don't want to mess up. And guess what? I could. I could. You could. We could. We could mess up. I know there's a lot of people that want to act like, no, not me. I ain't going to mess up. Yeah, okay. The word of God says, you know, you have to be careful lest you also fall. You gotta be careful. You gotta, you gotta be careful how you judge another. You gotta be careful how you talk about other people because you could fall. Every one of us can fall. And the Bible says, if God didn't leave a remnant among us, we all would have been a hot mess. We all would have been messy. We all would have been jacked up, right? And if truth be told about everything that you did, please. Maybe some people who are part of your fan club wouldn't be a part of your fan club if they knew everything that you did, right? If they knew everything that you was involved with, they knew everything that you said, everything that you dream about, everything. Maybe they wouldn't hear your prophecies no more. Come on now, somebody talk back to me. If they knew brother, every right, dream, brother. if they knew every dream, sister, you right about that. If they knew every dream that you had, and every time you woke up, right? And you didn't pee in the bed, but your bed was wet. Uh-huh. Talk back to me. If, if, if they knew every time you did something, maybe nobody would follow you. It's only by the grace and mercy of God that you are still standing. Only the grace and mercy of God that people don't know all your junk. And I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful that God gives me and has given me another chance. And so because of that, we, I, you, have got to beat our body into subjection. Because if we let this body have its way, then you're going to be lost. So I'm going to give you four things that you need to do in order to break the bondages of your flesh and then I'm gonna let you go. Four things, right? And I'm gonna go through them really quickly, right? Number one, you need to discipline yourself. Discipline yourself. And I'm gonna read the scripture real quick that, that couples with it, and that way you can just put this in your note, meditate on it later on, right? Uh, and that's Job 31 and verse one. This is what Job said. He says, I have made a covenant with my eyes. Why then should I look upon a young woman, right? What was he talking about? He's saying, I have covenant with God that I'm not going to allow my eyes to look at things that God says no. So he said, because of that, why am I going to look at a young woman? Why am I going to look at a young woman? And so you got to watch those friends that want you to break your discipline. You got to watch those friends. If you say, you know what? I'm not going to watch reality TV, right? If you say, I'm not going to waste my time with reality TV. Watch those friends and say, hey, did you see so-and-so? Oh my God, it was something else. You should see it. Hey, watch this video. This video is amazing. Oh my God, it's so funny. Oh my God, you should see. Y'all see this look in my face? Discipline your body. Discipline your body and don't let no one drag you down. Don't let no one, I don't care how close they are to you, tell them, no, don't pass that junk to me anymore. Or my friend, after all these years that known each other, 
You better know this about me. I'm going to block you. Look. Okay? You want to gain mastery over your flesh? Discipline your flesh, number one. Number two. Number two, your devotion. What are you devoted to? What are you devoted to? Right? Question is, are you stronger in those weak areas today than you were last year? Or are you still doing the same thing? Look at 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. And when you get to 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 17 and 18, it says, you therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, beware lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the error of the wicked, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus, Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to him be glory both now and forever. Amen. Are you stronger today than you were last year? Or are you just the same person, just a little bit more churchy? Okay, so number one, discipline yourself. Number two, how devoted are you? Are you devoting yourself more and more and more, right? Number three, right? Number three, if you want to break the bondages of your flesh, right, you got to think about this. What is it that you desire? What is it? You, what's your outcome? What's your outcome in everything that you do? You want to buy those shoes, you want to buy that suit, you want to buy those gadgets. What's your outcome? What's the end result? Look at me in James chapter one. And I'm trying to go through this quickly so I can let you guys go because I've had you long enough. And I thank you for your patience. James chapter one and verse 14. It says, but each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. So your failures in life will happen because you are drawn away by your own desires. By That's the stuff that's going to mess you up. Not nobody else. I know we want to spend our, our days blaming everybody else for our problems. Well, they just won't act right. They just won't do right. How about you? Are you doing right? You know, they always got an attitude. How about your attitude? Okay. So you got to look at your desires. What is it you want? What's your end result in that? Right. And, and, and what do you get from that? And I want to couple with James chapter one, John chapter 14 and verse 21. Jesus said these words, he who has my commandments and keep them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my father and I will love him and manifest myself to him. The reason why God has been bless, blessing me and keeping my life is because I've been increasing my discipline. I've been increasing my devotion and I've been increasing my desire towards him, right? And I recognize the parts of me that doesn't and the flesh of me that is trying to pull me away. And I confess those things to him and God gives me grace and he teaches me more of his word, right? And finally, the last thing, if you want to break, you want to break the bondages of your flesh. You want to break the, that fleshly way, right? Not only do you need discipline, devotion, and you need to uh, change your desires, right? Finally, you need to be diligent. Too many of us, we start a thing. We're not intentional. We start a thing, but we don't finish it, right? We are masters with starting something. Look at Psalms 119, Psalms 119 and verses 9 to 11. It says, how can a young man cleanse his way or a young woman? By taking heed according to your word, God. With my whole heart, I have sought you. Oh, let me not wander from your commandments. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against thee. So you need to be diligent. The word of God says, be not weary in well-doing, for you shall reap 
if you faint not. You got to be diligent. The word of God said the race is not given to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, but every prize is given to the one that endures to the end. You've got to make it to the end. You're not going to beat this flesh by just saying no one time. No, you got to say no over and over and over and over and over again. You got to say no, because just in the moment that you relax, just in the moment that you lay off, the flesh is going to come back again. That's why Paul said in Romans chapter seven, who's going to deliver me from the body of this death, this body that's trying to kill me, trying to bring me into subjection. So you got to discipline yourself. You got to have devotion, right? You got to increase your devotion towards God. You got to increase your desires towards God. And you got to be diligent. You do those four things on a regular basis. And I'm telling you, you're going to see transformation in your life. You're going to see maturity happening in your life. You're going to see recovery from heartache and heartbreak, right? Because your flesh want to keep you stuck in that hurtful place. Your flesh want to make that the, the central theme of everything that goes on in your life. And you got to break the flesh in order for you to live. Because if you don't, your flesh will kill you. God bless you. Let us pray. Father God, I thank you for this time, Lord God. And I thank you for the discipline that these your people have had, Lord God, to be with me this length of time. Father, I pray that you would bless each and every one of them. And I pray that there was something that I said tonight, Lord God, that will help them and instruct them. And Lord God, help them to be better for you. Lord, we thank you for how you've forgiven us and washed us of all of our sin. We thank you, Lord God, for how you are perfecting us and you're doing us such a mighty work in our lives. God, help us step by step, day by day, moment by moment, Lord God, to have the discipline, the desire, the devotion, Lord God, and the diligence, Lord God, to do everything that you would desire for us to do. For Lord God, it's only by your grace and mercy that we stand. And so God, as we leave this place, but never from your presence, give us a restful night's sleep and bless us this night in Jesus' name to do of your good pleasure. We glorify you. We honor you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you for joining me, uh, Sister Jacqueline and Sister Natasha. I spared y'all from the Q&A, you know. <laughs> Amen. I spared you. Thank God you, bless Dr. You. Sister Carol. <laughs> and Dr. Carol, I see you. You came in as well. God bless you. Amen. So you guys have a great evening. You Thank as you. well. Thank you, Pastor. You're welcome, dear. God bless you. Yes, we have a great night, Pastor. You as well. God bless. God bless. You. God bless. Have a great night, guys. Amen. You too. God bless you. God bless. God bless you, Sheree. God bless you, Paula. Edna, God bless you. God bless you, uh, uh, Reverend Ken. God bless you, brother. God bless you, Miss Dorothy. God bless you. Thank you for joining with me. Have a wonderful evening, everyone. God bless you, Louise. God bless you. God bless you, brother Eric. God bless you, man. Have a great night. God bless you, Paula. Amen. Good to see you all. May you have a blessed evening. Amen. God bless you, Julia. God bless you. Thank you for sharing the videos and for your encouragements. Thank you so much. Amen. God bless you all. Have a good night, everyone. May the Lord bless you. May his face shine upon you and give you peace. God bless you. Have a blessed evening. In Jesus' name, God bless.